Okay, uh, thank you. Hello everyone, and uh, a very warm welcome to this UN General Assembly special session side event, Collective Action Building Efficient Public and Private Partnerships, which we are co-hosting with Swiss Federal Department of Foreign Affairs. My particular thanks go to Martin Matta and to the Federal Department of Foreign Affairs for the coordination and the co-organization and collaboration um, that has made this event possible. My name is Gemma Iolfi uh, from the Basel Institute, and I have the honor and pleasure to host and moderate this session um, today. Before we start, may I encourage everyone in the audience to use the Q&A to write short questions, and if there's no time to answer them all, we'll try to capture them in our written summary uh, afterwards. Please check our website for that in time. I'm honored and uh, very pleased to welcome Ambassador Stefan Esteman, who will open this session. Ambassador Esteman served as a Swiss government's representative to Croatia and currently heads the Sectoral Foreign Policies Division, cooperating with specialized federal offices in the Swiss administration to promote domestic and foreign policy coherence across a broad range of thematic issues, including anti-corruption. In this capacity, he chairs Switzerland's Interdepartmental Working Group on Combating Corruption. Ambassador Esteban, you're most welcome and thank you very much uh, for co-hosting and helping us to organize. The floor is yours, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Iolfi and the ladies and gentlemen. As a matter of fact, the division that I'm heading recently changed uh, name and we are now called the Prosperity and Sustainability Division. And corruption definitely is uh, pretty much the contradiction of anything we could uh, consider to be sustainable. So I think the new name is very accurate, including regarding the work on anti-corruption that, that we do. Um, dear friends and colleagues, the Swiss government is proud to partner with the Basel Institute in sponsoring this side event on collective action. The Basel Institute has inspired and promoted collective action initiatives ever since it was founded in 2003. It has advised a wide range of private sector, non-governmental and governmental actors, and firmly established itself as an international knowledge center in this field. The Swiss government benefited from the Basel Institute's experience and advice in drafting our first national anti-corruption strategy that was adopted in November of last year. One of the goals of the Swiss strategy is to ensure that companies with honest business practices do not find themselves at a competitive disadvantage on international markets. We are determined to support the companies that invest in compliance and do business with integrity. As a state party to the United Nations Convention Against uh, Corruption, we are supposed to promote the use of good commercial practices among businesses and between businesses and the state. This is Article 12 of the Convention. I would argue that collective action is indeed a good practice, not just because it is undertaken for all the right reasons, but also because it works. So what is collective action? I will not define it, but simply say that it is the solution to collective action problems, like the so-called prisoner's dilemma. Collective action problems arise in situations where individuals would be better off cooperating, but fail to do so because they do not trust each other, or at least not enough. This applies to preventing and fighting corruption. We all know that corruption is bad for business. All the state parties of the United Nations Convention Against Corruption are committed to prohibiting foreign bribery and to enforcing its prohibition. But can we be really sure that our main competitors will play by the rules? Are we not putting our companies at a disadvantage if we vigorously enforce the foreign bribery prohibition, while some competitors may be allowed to take a free ride and bribe their way into new markets? 
To this problem, the OECD Anti-Bribery Convention, through collective action, has produced an ingenious solution. Thanks to a robust peer review mechanism, the parties are assured that other jurisdictions will indeed enforce the foreign bribery prohibition and that their companies will not undercut fair competition by resorting to corrupt practices. Of course, we would be even more comfortable if all major exporting countries were parties to this convention and participated in the peer review. For collective action to be successful, the most important players should be on board. At today's side event, we are going to explore a few examples of collective action. I look forward to learning more about these initiatives from the distinguished panelists. We are going to see how collective action plays out in different environments. According to the political declaration adopted at this special session of the General Assembly Against Corruption, all UN member states will encourage the private sector to take collective action, including through the establishment of public-private partnerships. Let us therefore continue to develop these tools and use them more broadly. I hope that the success stories that lie before us will indeed inspire more initiatives in more markets and environments. Each success story builds more confidence that we can overcome corruption if we do it together. In the name of the Swiss government, I wish to thank the Basel Institute for co-organizing this side event and the panelists for their readiness to share lessons learned. Thank you very much. And I'm very much looking forward to the contributions. Thank you, Ms. Ifioli. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador, uh, for your inspiring words and kind words about the Basel Institute, really much appreciated. I'm uh, about to start the panel session, but just before we do so, we would uh, once more remind the audience to use the Q&A button if you'd like to raise a question. Uh, and also we thought we'd have a very quick poll to see whether anyone is currently involved in any collective action initiatives. So I'm going to ask my colleague Monica, Monica to pull up the poll and hopefully you'll all see it and can vote by pressing yes or no. So if you're involved in any collective action, um, please just let us know. We'd be very keen to, to, to hear from you. Maybe Monica, you can uh, share the results when it looks like uh, people have... Uh, so it's a 45-55 split. So we've got the potential to uh, interest uh, others and also perhaps to hear from uh, some of the audience and their experiences. But um, thank you for that. Um, we have a, a, a great uh, and distinguished uh, group of individuals bringing a wealth of experience on anti-corruption collective action. Let me just briefly introduce, introduce the panelists to everyone, uh, and then we'll kick off with, uh, with the first round of questions. Um, Klaus Mosmeyer is Chief Ethics, Risk and Compliance Officer at Novartis, the pharmaceutical company headquartered here in Switzerland. Uh, Klaus was previously Chief Compliance Officer at Siemens and brings a, a wealth of experience uh, with him on this topic. Also to, with us today is Cecilia Muller-Torbrand. She is the CEO of the Maritime Anti-Corruption Network, which she helped to set up in 2011 while working for Maersk, the shipping company. And since, uh, more or less since that time, she has led the MACN um, with great uh, success. Panna Ratan Panankong is the project director to Thailand's Collective Action Against Corruption Coalition, and he established its small and medium-sized companies certification program and the citizen feedback projects. Earlier in his career, he worked for Shell in various roles all over the world, uh, so has seen uh, life in the private sector uh, as well as in um, uh, civil society. Gilbert Sendugwa is senior regional manager for Africa for COST, the Infrastructure Transparency Initiative, 
And he's a founding member of the COST Uganda Initiative, and he's uh, with us, joining us today from Uganda. And he has played a key role in developing its multi-stakeholder group. So welcome to all my panelists. Thank you very much for joining. And we'd like to really start by um, demonstrating the variety and scope of collective action. The ambassador said uh, he didn't want to define it, uh, perhaps because it is such a diverse uh, and interesting um, broad scope these days. So you're all working with different forms of collective action to address corruption risks and raise standards of integrity and fair business in your countries and in your business sectors, but in quite different ways. So it would be really interesting just to hear briefly from each of you what collective action means for you and what form it has taken. Maybe Klaus, I'll turn to you first of all, if I may, for that uh, question. Yeah, thank you, Gemma. And again, thank you for, for having me at this, this wonderful panel and to the ambassador for the impactful um, keynote uh, to open up the panel. I, I always compare the fight against corruption with the fight against the pandemic at the moment. It's, it's clear that we can only win the fight or address the fight together. There is no way that a country, a company, a government, uh, an NGO will, will win the fight alone. So it's a coalition of, of integrity, as it needs to be a coalition in the fight against the COVID-19. This is, this is crystal clear. So a coalition of integrity needs to be based on trust between the different partners. And that, for my own learning, was the first difficult thing to overcome. So I, I came heavily into collective action when we, back at Siemens, when we had the, the settlement with the World Bank. And for the first time, we said, let's devote the settlement 100 million US dollar for collective action going forward. And we had no idea how to do this. I mean, so we started there building trust, building trust with society, building trust with NGOs, with all kinds of parts of civil society to start tangible integrity projects in countries and in communities. So what I want to say is it needs trust and it needs to be very tangible. Then as the ambassador has pointed out, you need the support of the multilateral institution. The ambassador mentioned the OECD. Today, we, we speak more also uh, at the United Nations. We have the WEF, we have other of these platforms. And, you know, sometimes the people are cynical about these platforms. Yes, they are slow, but if you see how uh, the United Nations, the OECD and other platforms are important to form trust because there we can meet companies, civil society, governments, and start talking about, about collective action. So you need the tangible results, and then you need also the international platforms to build the legal framework. And so trust is needed, tangible examples are needed, and I will talk more about the pharmaceutical industry later. Back to you, Gemma, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Klaus, for those uh, opening thoughts and um, a bit of your history too uh, into all of this. So uh, turning to Cecilia, perhaps you can um, give us a little bit of a flavor of your um, collective action with the maritime industry. Uh, and again, how that has, uh, what that means for you in terms of uh, collective action. Thank you, Cecilia, the floor is yours. I think you're on mute. After all this time, still you make that mistake, right? It's incredible. So starting over, thank you so much, Ambassador, uh, for your inspiring words. Great to be here with so many, you know, uh, compliance and anti-corruption experts. And certainly we are a huge fan of Basil, as, as you know. So I'm also really pleased to, to be here with Gemma today. So thank you. Um, I mean, the whole, what I'm, the organization I'm representing, the Maritime Anti-Corruption uh, Network, MACN, is, I mean, our fundamental block stands on collective action. And that was the, the reason why we got started in, in the first place. And that is, I think, the reason why we are continuing, because we do see progress and we do see success in this field. Um, coming from a private sector, having a compliance officer background, and uh, specifically meeting frontline people who face this experience in high risk markets every day 
for me, the business clear, the business case is, is really clear that regardless how the, how big the company is, you cannot solve this in silos. You can have perfect programs, but uh, it's a very simple equation of if everybody else says yes, and you're the only company that's pushing standards in a different integrity stand, you would you would still have challenges. And the, the ones that are most impacted is the people who are operating on the ground in these high risk markets, right? So for me, collective action is basically two building blocks. It is the private sector engagement, which we may or may stand for because we do represent an industry collective action, right? We represent over 50% of the world's tonnage, which is how you measure shipping. Um, but that is really this success, I think, in itself to bring private sector participants together, um, try to drive standards, discuss really concrete issues and try to come to like a common goal on how we want to approach this. Um, we had one of our captains at our members meeting last week to, to say MSCN serves as a moral booster for me because I, I know that it's not only me and it's not only my company who say no. I know I have the backing of all these other companies. So that actually empowers me to say no. And I love the world more booster, but just because we're compliance experts, we kind of like that. But I mean, that is really for me, the, the collective action, the strength of that can actually be just having companies coming together. Um, where I do think the, the shipping sector, I mean, we have so many small companies, right? So I think other, if, if the shipping sector can do it, there's so many other business sectors that can really come together in quite powerful alliances on the topic of integrity and compliance. Then of course, you know, collective action for me, it's about public private partnerships. It's about like the industry can just do so much. And I think Klaus, you spoke a bit to the role of international and intergovernmental organization, but also how do you get governments into this and have a conversation with governments on what is actually that we're trying to solve. Um, and when I, when I talk about governance, governments, I do think it's both governments that have high corruption risk in their countries, but also governments who have very strict you know, ambitions on anti-corruption enforcement. It's like, how do we actually support companies to be have good ethical practices and want to be stay in these markets that have high, high, that have high risk uh, for corruption? So you have to have everybody around the table um, and we can come a, around a bit more about trust and all that. But I do think that the way we, we need to articulate in getting people around the table is that it's not about corruption, it's about the impact of corruption, right? So for shipping, it's about what does it cost in terms of trade, right? We sit with, you know, if, if there's a corruption in the ports, that means that these countries are suffering because increased trade costs, slower efficiency, there is a value, there is an incentive for these governments to come to the table that goes beyond the subject of corruption. Um, because I think you can speak to any corrupt official and he will agree, he or she, or, or a private sector representative, and they will agree that corruption is bad, right? So it's about how do we get, how do we make corruption as concrete as possible? And we do that by creating a stakeholder dialogue that has incentives for everyone to participate. Um, and if you have a private sector engagement already, you can articulate that very well to uh, other stakeholders around the table because you have a lot of intelligence of what's actually going on in the field. And you can then try to be smart and actually convey that message in a different way uh, getting those people to the table because it's important for them. Um, so that was a bit of a leverage post, but I do think that it's important to talk about collective action from a private sector perspective. What can you achieve in your own business and how do we actually get everybody around the table? Because it's only then we can actually come to concrete measures and we can elaborate a bit on, on what that means later for, for MACM. Thank you, Cecilia. You might have liked the phrase moral booster, but I really like your stakeholder dialogue with incentives for everyone uh, as a really great uh, catchphrase. And I think we're gonna come back to that uh, in a moment, but let me uh, uh, allow Panna uh, to, take the, to take the floor and to tell us a little bit about um, his initiative, which is with small and medium-sized enterprises, particular focus at the moment, um, and uh, tell us important. Uh, tell us about the important work that, that that you're doing there, and what collective action uh, brings to that to that sector. Thank you, Panna. The floor is yours. Yes, thank you, Gemma. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ambassador Esterman, for your uh, kind opening speech, and uh, 
uh, to our esteemed hosts at the Basel Institute, as well as the distinguished panel members and guests. Uh, the Thai Private Sector Collective Action Against Corruption, or CAC, in Thailand uh, is a collective action of private companies uh, looking to build uh, a platform so that leaders in the business that is uh, uh, keen on promoting transparency and uh, anti-corruption can come together. And we need this platform in the form of collective action because without any type of collective action, whether in the public private sector, is gonna be very, very difficult to tackle the corruption problem. So the CAC uh, views collective action as a place where uh, voluntarily uh, business leaders can bring in their uh, employees, the businesses, as well as build system of compliance within their companies to be immune, as Klaus has also mentioned, against the uh, threat of corruption risk. And how we do that is that we uh, put together our unique certification program so the companies can come in and join as well as through the process, uh, build up the compliance um, within their, their, their companies. Um, I think it is also important to address that this platform of collective action has to have something for everybody. And the way we organize the collective action is that we mirror it similar to our sort of education progression, I guess. So you have uh, high school and college bachelor degree and master degree and PhD. So companies, whether listed companies or small, medium-sized companies, mountain national, can choose how they want to participate. And I think this is key because you don't, if you uh, have only one size, it's not gonna fit and, and, and attract everybody. And so the key to collective action for us is to have a way for everybody, everybody to participate. Uh, companies can maybe first declare intentions to join the collective action, which is no more complicated than signing a one piece declaration paper. Um, and then they can progress through our certification program. If it's a, a small, medium sized company, then they have a simpler process than a large company. Um, and then they can also become change agents, what we call them as change agent, which is large companies who is already proficient, already immune um, through the compliance process. They can also bring in their supply chain uh, of SMEs to be certified as well. And I think uh, ultimately what we want is a transparent ecosystem in the country to be able to fight corruption. Thank you. Thank you very much, Panna. And I think that uh, the idea of certification is one that um, is gaining traction in uh, many parts of the world because uh, SMEs do need help. They don't have the same capacities that, that large companies have when it comes to compliance. So I think your um, example is a, is a great one um, that many other countries are interested or other business associations are uh, interested in finding out uh, more about. Um, I'm gonna to turn to Gilbert um, and to hear a bit about um, COST, the Infrastructure Transparency Initiative, but particularly in the context of uh, your region in Africa uh, and to tell us a little bit about a collective action uh, from your perspective. Thank you, Gilbert, the floor is yours. You're also on mute, Gilbert, sorry. Sorry about that. Thank you very much, uh, Gemma, and thank you, Ambassador, for uh, warm and strong intro introductory remarks. But more importantly, in creating this space for us to be discussing this important topic uh, as part of the Angus. Now, to me, collective action means uh, different stakeholders you know, working together to address common challenges or indeed take uh, advantage of uh, opportunities to advance a common cause. And COST, the Infrastructure Transparency Initiative uses corrective action to, tr uh, to promote transparency, accountability, and performance of infrastructure projects. Now, in Africa, and I believe uh, in the world, 
the issue of transparency and accountability in infrastructure projects uh, has been a common issue of concern. And uh, the OECD and even also Transparency International ranks corruption in infrastructure projects among the top four. So it is an important issue that affects everyone and needs corrective action. So what we do um, uh, here in, across Africa through the cost programs, we build uh, more stakeholder working groups that bring on board governments, civil society and business. And this form the steering group to run our programs uh, across, I mean, in each of the countries. Now in uh, Marawi, for example, our working um, MSG, as we call them, has 12 members, uh, five from government, six from civil society, and one from business, private sector. In Uganda, and in Marawi, I should say that the president, you know, uh, has accepted to be the champion of the program. And since coming on board, we see a lot of uh, progress, one of which is in the area of disclosure. And uh, in Uganda, our MSG has three, uh, I mean, uh, nine members, three from government, three from business, and three from civil society. Now, through this, the issue of lack of trust has been addressed, which was affecting, you know, uh, relationships across these stakeholders. Remember that on any infrastructure projects, there are very multiple uh, stakeholders. We have the funders, we have the client, we have contractors and subcontractors, consultants, project affected persons, and beneficiaries. Many times, these have competing and conflicting interests, and this uh, brings a problem and escalates lack of trust. So our approach is built on four pillars. The first being my stakeholder working, uh, the second being disclosure, and we have developed two standards to facilitate disclosure of infrastructure data. We have uh, independent verification of what has been disclosed, otherwise called assurance process, and then social accountability, where we empower various users of information to hold the various actors accountable. Now, some of the things that have happened, for example, in the uh, past one year, uh, we have assured 36 projects across Africa, five countries in Africa where we work. And in Uganda, we have made, uh, we have raised 40 issues over the last uh, five years and made 23 recommendations. Uh, we are glad that slightly right above 50% of these have been addressed. The most important being, uh, being establishment of a working group and then also improving disclosure based on these standards. The feeling of trust that, you know, people are able to express themselves, share challenges and address them together has also been one of the most fundamental um, issues that, uh, um, has been recognized. And uh, we see for, uh, from time to time, for example, in Uganda, three times, government has invited COST to address annual sector review meetings on this important issue of addressing and um, promoting integrity in infrastructure projects. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gilbert. Uh, we'll hear a little bit more, I think, about your work uh, in a moment. But um, you've all mentioned trust, and um, the ambassador also mentioned it as being a very important part of the whole um, mix between private and public uh, sector collective action. So, Cecilia, maybe I can turn back to you. One of your initiatives involves a reporting mechanism, and obviously rec reporting is an important part of anti-corruption compliance programs and ways of identifying weaknesses and risks. 
but sometimes people are afraid of being retaliated against or don't trust that anything will really change or happen um, and they hold back uh, reporting of wrongdoing. So perhaps we'd like to hear a little bit about your experience of your, your, of your reporting mechanism and what I understand you've also got help desks in some countries uh, to support businesses and to just hear about how that works um, and that, how that has evolved uh, from the early days uh, of your uh, network. And lucky me, I started the unmute button first before speaking, so that's great. So yes, uh, about 10 years ago, MSN started what we call our incident, anonymous incident reporting mechanism, which is, again, for the industry. So it doesn't replace the structure you need to have in the companies, but it does enable um, companies and individuals who have been exposed to a corrupt demand reported into MACN. We don't record the individual. We don't record either who demanded it or who made a report. Um, so it's anonymous. Uh, we only document what is the corrupt demand, um, what happened, what type of report was it, uh, what type of official, what type of department, etc. And of course, that was uh, very controversial when we started that 10 years ago. I still think to a certain sense it is. There was a lot of discussion around that. Uh, what, is, what is the, how do you dare to make the report? But I think in, in MACM, because we have made it anonymous, we have made it actually now uh, so open. So it's not just for the membership. It is an industry kind of like hotline, you can say. Um, so we have over 45,000 incidents now collected globally, right? And that is, that is for us, serves two very distinct purposes. It's not a evidence box that you hand over to the authorities in those countries and say, you know, just investigate. Is It is for the private sector, this serves as a risk mitigation tool because companies can go in and I can see what am I expected to face in certain countries, in, all down to the port level. So every we all look for good data and try to understand what is actually specific. I think what's unique about MSCN here is that we can give that back to the shipping industry on a port level, right? So you can prepare your captains better or whoever sits in, in the operation team because they will they can also serve as an element into your, especially for multinational, I would say, bigger risk assessment who often sits with a do, lot of different data. MSCN serves as one of those evaluations for countries, for, for, for business cases, for, for investment, et cetera. So I think that for the private sector, it's been extremely valuable to really understand what are we faced with? What can we expect? For the, for the public sector, for the governments, we have really used this as a door opener. We're not naming shaming companies and countries or companies, but countries, is, it's, not in our, it's not in our DNA. Uh, we use that data to kind of knock on the door and say, here is a systemic issue that we see in regards to processing immigration papers or in regards to uh, a specific type of, of, of department, right? And that has really been a success in the dialogues with governments because you bring something to the table in an early stage that is extremely concrete. Um, and they it's hard to kind of, even though they, you can, you know, if you're a statistical expert, you can say, well, you can really, I'm sure, talk about the data in a different form. But for us, this is not the, it's not how it is. It's not the result. It's a start of a conversation, right? So what that has led to, if I may use a couple of countries, like for instance, in Nigeria, that kind of triggered a root cause analysis from the government in trying to understand what is actually going on in the vessel clearance process. So that triggers an investigation or like a, a, a root cause a gap assessment, which is then owned by the government. So you kind of poke them but you're not just handing over and saying, this is the truth, this is how it is, right? Because you want ownership in the process. Unless you, you have that, you're not gonna come, you're not gonna come to solutions later on. And the root cause analysis and the ongoing dialogue on the data, how it links to trade efficiency, how it links to other, other priorities that which the government has, um, we have then been able to motivate them to do training we have motivated them to uh, improve port processes, right? 
we can really identify what the risks are, we can show data, and then they can actually work on actually understanding what would that mean from their end. And in that case, it was really about understanding what happens when, when people come on board the vessels, uh, we need more procedures for this, we need to really understand how long should a port call be, uh, can they stay on for five hours? No, it should actually be 50 minutes or 45 minutes and then they should actually be done. So it helps to kind of make, to set processes that will also improve trade efficiency, but also lim uh, eliminate and mitigate corruption. And that eventually it also led to the third pillar, which we now have in a couple of countries, which is also escalation channels that, that, um, that we, in the perfect scenario, we don't want that data to come to us. It's good, it's, it's needed, but we want the data to go to the government so they can really improve processes then and there and then, and they can start investigating if they need to. So in Nigeria and also in Ukraine, which you're piloting, we actually have help desks. Uh, I think the, the, the Nigeria case is, 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 is a great example because we actually have clear ownership for the government. And we have amazing local partners, which I really should give all credit to, because these are actually partners, our uh, people who work on the ground and, and really bridge the conversation with private sector and, and public um, public sector. Uh, Sotia Pampa from Convention for Business Integrity in Nigeria is our partner there. And he's actually then encouraging and empowering the government officials to solve issues. So we've actually gone from the, the MACS reporting mechanism remain. It's, it's a channel of frustration when you're reporting, when you've been faced with corrupt demand, that dialogue remains. But in these countries where we've come further, companies can actually escalate it into the authorities and we follow the case and we can actually see it's been resolved. Um, so we've seen a, a success of business trusting, making reports into the government and it's not going to be, we'll come back with you in six months. It's coming back to them with a few hours, very solution oriented. So business has then felt empowered to report more because they actually get their, their issues solved. Like if there is a corrupt demand, they have somewhere to turn to. It doesn't affect them um, from a safety perspective or from a commercial perspective because they can, they can actually dare to report. And the government is on board in trying to figure out why this has happened. Was it a glitch in the procedures? Is there an official that is not maybe behaving as, as, as according to the procedures, et cetera? So I think the journey of 10 years, and I think we started to really see the fruit of that, is that how we can actually empower governments to come up with business suitable solutions. Because I think that's also missing in a lot of these countries that there are escalation channels, there, there are reporting mechanisms. But the incentive for business is that they need to have issues solved. That should have ideally happened yesterday. And instead, we see now we are, we are, the governments and business are starting to work together in a time frame that suits both. It's investment on both sides, but it suits them both. Um, and then we see in more and more reports, more escalations also happening on a national level. Thank you, Cecilia. We're a little bit short of time. Yes, so sorry. I'm, I'm sorry that we have to race through some of it. It's really fascinating. But I think um, the, the collection of data, to put it uh, very simply, is clearly a huge driver for both sides, the public side and the, and the private sector side. And Gilbert, perhaps uh, you also mentioned collection of data and collecting of, of facts and enabling um, different uh, stakeholders to come together. Perhaps you can give us a bit of an example of, of, of how this has actually worked in practice uh, in, your, in your transparency initiatives, but I'll have to ask you to be fairly concise. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, one of the case studies that I'd like to share is in respect to Uganda, where we've been implementing a program supported by the UK government on promoting business integrity. Now, initially, we got a challenge to get on board business. And this is what is, uh, some people said that uh, corruption is good because it gets uh, work done in uh, environments like uh, the ones we, where we work. The other group said that uh, they don't have time for endless meetings of civil society and government because their time is for making money. So under this program, we carried out uh, our research on factors affecting uh, participation of businesses in uh, integrity programs and public procure, uh, contracting. We shared results, discussed with everyone, 
and uh, also made quite strong recommendations. What was important also is businesses got this information and used it by themselves to engage parliament, to engage Minister of Finance, the Public Procurement Authority, and they got very positive uh, feedback and actions from uh, these stakeholders. And this created a major incentive for them to really get engaged uh, on the program. So uh, in short, they are now one of the key players in our program. The government has set up a working group on uh, integrity and uh, they have been meeting monthly. Uh, that is uh, the civil society, government and business. And one of the key issues that, they have, uh, that has been prioritized under this is uh, promoting integrity. So this is one of the case studies that I'd like to share. Moving from you know, uh, being uh, opposed or negative or unsure to being real players and champion on the table, uh, which we see that it is working very well. Thank you. Thank you, Gilbert. Thank you for that. It's very inspiring in a very difficult environment and infrastructure um, suffers uh, from challenges, not only um, on the continent of Africa, but also in just about every part of the world, including here in Switzerland, I have to say. Um, and we've heard of many other European countries as well where infrastructure uh, has not been uh, well developed. Panna, maybe we can turn to a completely different um, area of, of, of collective action. And that's really what this panel is all about, is to show the diversity and to show the amazing different results that can all contribute to creating uh, the right conditions for business to thrive. And your initiative has been helping small and mid-sized companies to develop anti-corruption compliance programs, including through mentoring and exchanging with groups of different stakeholders, as you said uh, in your first remarks about um, large companies uh, being ready then to help smaller ones. Can you tell us how that really works in practice and how the members see the benefit of that initiative? How do they get to that uh, stage of mentoring? And do you see an increase in trust uh, between the large and small companies uh, as a result of that and, and can see real tangible benefits for business. Thank you, Gemma. So before uh, we talk about the benefits, I'll offer an explanation on what exactly do we do as a collective action. And I think this may apply in other collective action as well. So we have three strategic mission for the RCAC. And number one is that we want to gain critical mass because without the critical mass, you're not a collective action per se. So the bigger the collective action, the more uh, membership or uh, private uh, enterprise join, the more influential, the more impactful the collective action will be. The second mission is that we want to uplift compliance, basic, basically build the immunity that we were talking about or build the compliance um, at various levels so that over time, uh, the company can progress through different type of certification to, and build their uh, compliance system. And we do that, as I mentioned, with uh, steps along the way, with just declaration, signing a declaration, then going through the certification and then becoming a change agent where they ultimately help out the supply chain. And our third mission is to co-create change with the uh, public sector. And so, as similar to the MACN, um, our members ask the ultimate question about what is it going to happen when they go into these uh, 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 agencies or work with these agencies and face corruption? Is it going to be better over time or uh, what's going to be the benefit? And so these are the three things that our collective action is focusing on. Um, your question around the interaction between the stakeholders um, namely the large and the small medium enterprise is fascinating. Um, many countries are trying to get the SMEs to be on board in their collective action. And we explore the idea of reaching out to the SMEs one-on-one. -on -one. And as you know, you know, any country can have up to a couple million uh, SMEs in the country. And so it's impossible for us to reach out on a one-on-one -on -one basis. And we came up with this model where we asked the large companies that have already gone through our certification to become the big brother of their uh, suppliers. So 
companies like supermarket chains or banks or real estate developers, uh, some of them have thousands of suppliers selling them products and services. And what better way is for them to select maybe their top 50, top 100 suppliers and bring them on board into our program. And the benefits are both ways. For the large companies, I always put it simply that they sleep better at night, right? So if you have uh, a, a corporation where you're, you're managing a supply chain of, of, of 1,000 SMEs, well, at any given time, these SMEs, if they're not uh, fully compliant or aware of the anti-corruption uh, measures, can um, experience uh, corruption incidents, whereas the risk transfers back to the, uh, the, the, the corporation. And we've seen in, in many cases where, you know, suppliers or contractors or agents or advisor, however you name these, these uh, individuals or, or parties, transact on a uh, uh, illegal, you know, uh, bribery scenario where uh, it, it results in legal and reputational damages to the, the big corporation. So that's the benefit on the uh, large companies. For the SMEs, uh, of course, having other competitors in, 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 in the same space become compliance on anti-corruption makes the competition more fair um, when they go and bid for services and contracts from these large companies, you know that everybody's on the same level playing field and uh, they, 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 they really like this benefit. Thank you. Thank you, Pana. That's, that's great. Um, well, maybe I'll just stay with you just for one moment if I, if I can. One of the questions in the, in the Q&A has been about what can we do, what more can be done for SMEs to meet their, what are their unmet needs? I don't know whether you have a, 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 a 30 second answer on that one. So we, we started the SME certification program two years ago. And uh, as I mentioned, it has uh, been quite interesting over the two years. Um, initially, we got a lot of interest. Um, we have to currently over a thousand SMEs, sorry, a hundred SMEs declaring intentions to join, about two dozen already passed certification. But because of COVID-19, I think it's been especially difficult for the SMEs. We tried calling about hundred, a hundred SMEs um, towards the end of last year, and half of them don't even pick up their phone. So you can imagine that the businesses might be closed or the office is, is shut, shut down. Um, I think the key success factor for the SME is benefits. And uh, really, you know, you're asking them to spend time, resources uh, on building their compliances. And uh, this takes, you know, of course, uh, their focus uh, away from, from making money uh, running the business. So you have to offer benefits from them. I'll tell you a short story. One of the SMEs came to me last year uh, and told me that, um, he really saw the benefit of CAC in reducing the cost and expense of buying gifts. And I asked the, uh, the owner of the business, well, it must be quite a, an expense for you. And he says, yes, uh, every year he had to buy two or three pickup trucks um, to be given to an agency or agencies for raffles or lucky draw, New Year uh, lucky draw. And he was at a point where he couldn't, um, uh, he couldn't find an excuse not to do that. And after coming on board with CAC, we heavily promoted a no gift policy within our 471 company members. And so everybody took this and, 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 and did the same announcement for the no gift policy. And in turn, it reduces this SME's gift expense from uh, several million baht to, to almost nothing uh, within the next year. Thank you. Uh, thank you. It's great to have real examples because that's what uh, draws in the private sector as well as the, the public sector. So I'm going to turn to Klaus uh, once more. And um, collaboration between the pharma industry and the government has been really extraordinary over the last 18 months, thinking of COVID-19 and how uh, we have all um, 
seen the benefits of vaccines being developed and um, working together. So pharma is already a highly regulated industry, as we know. Um, but do you think this is the start of a new era of trust and collaboration? Um, and perhaps you'd like to mention some of the existing uh, collective action initiatives that the pharmaceutical industry is uh, involved in um, and to, to tell us a little bit about your uh, personal thoughts on, on the future, looking into the crystal ball, if we can. Yeah, very much so. And thank you. And, and, and maybe two examples. One, you, you know, because you are yourself heavily involved, Gemma. But one thing is uh, what the colleagues already said, it's about the, the supply environment of companies. I mean, we all know that expectation of society is, is far more than the, the company conduct is also the ecosystem around the companies. And the topic of environmental human rights, anti-corruption, uh, fair working conditions, uh, in our supply chain is a is a core topic, and the industry should not be defensive on this, but also be willing to be a proactive leader. So, what the pharmaceutical industry is doing, we formed the the pharmaceutical supply chain initiative, where more than forty pharmaceutical companies are discussing about level the playing fields on these topics. And we will see a much more legislation on these issues, but we believe if we do a good collective action, of course, in the framework of the antitrust laws, we can do a lot. And also very tangible topics like cleaning up the Musi River in India, which is a topic for the pharmaceutical industry in India, they have all the tangible results. And maybe in the future, in the, the crystal ball there, if we agree on standards for suppliers in form of collective action, if we have digital passports for suppliers, we can we can be much more efficient in due diligence because we can use the same suppliers which are already proven. Have a digital due diligence passport by a collective action it would be a fantastic move for the business and for leveling the playing field. The other one about transparency and Gemma, you are involved there, so. Interesting, if you talk about ESG investors, Norges Investment Management, one of the biggest investment funds, took the initiative to bring a collective action together of pharmaceutical companies to agree on standards to measure compliance, efficiency, and to report about it. And, and you coordinated this group. There's another way of collective action, but talking about compliance standards, about reporting standards, and how we can generate more transparency together with investors, which is another part of society, right? So just on these two topics and maybe an interesting outlook for the future. Thank you very much, Klaus. Um, yes, I think that the, I think when you, you mentioned the, the broad, uh, broadening scope of what is compliance these days, it's a, it's a huge topic. And I think um, the last 18 months have even reinforced the importance of compliance and how it now touches a huger uh, array of, of topics. And I think uh, looking at the effectiveness of what is an effective compliance program, how do we measure it and how do we look at impact uh, will become part of, uh, of that even more as we, as we go forward. I'm mindful of the time, um, but I would like to have um, a couple of words really just very short from, from each of you, why you believe it is important for governments and multilateral institutions to endorse collective action and make it part of their strategies and guidance. Um, one of the questions in the Q&A has been, who should make the first move? Uh, should it be the private? It's an ongoing question always, who should, who should ask who to dance? Um, and we basically need uh, no more wallflowers, but to everybody to get up and dance together in some way. But uh, if you can, that's me just giving you a hint as to what the answer is to this question. But if you can um, tell us why you think it's really important for collective action to be endorsed, um, as we do hope it will uh, be in the final political declaration, we are fairly confident it will be uh, following this uh, UN session, not least thanks to the support of uh, enlightened governments. Um, so maybe let's go back round again. Gilbert, uh, what's, what do you think about this? All right, sorry, I don't know <laughs> what was happening with my uh, system. But uh, yes, this is really very important. The case study that I gave uh, earlier alone, when business demanded that uh, they needed more transparency, 
the government responded and uh, disclosure of projects increased from 200 to 449 in about nine months. So what this says is that uh, dialogue is important, a platform is important, and uh, when you create an environment of trust, everyone wants to bring what they have on the table. Everyone doesn't fear to bring out their fears so that they are discussed. So I think collective action is the way to go because you bring different stakeholders whose interests may initially be divergent, but as conversations grow, they move towards convergence. And we have seen uh, in our case that this convergence has brought real solutions and improvements in the delivery of uh, public infrastructure projects. Thank you. Thank you, Gilbert. Panna, do you think it should be part of government strategy to have uh, anti-corruption uh, collective action? Well, the short answer is, is of course, and whether you're talking about the government, any go or agency or pub public uh, private sector, if you drill down to the very, very formative level, it's individual, right? It's the all the citizen living in the country. And guess what? When there's a corruption problem in the country, everybody suffers. We know all that from bad environment, bad infrastructure, uh, the cost of living, you know, the pass through of all the briberies to whatever you buy and you use. So the victim here is everybody, whether or not you're a government, you're a public official even, or a citizen. So of course, everybody needs to work together. And the way to do that is for as many of uh, the people to come together through this collective action. And I think for us is that um, when we're living in a country which ranks 104 out of 180 in the CPI, we try to say that you're either part of the problem or part of the solution. If you think that you're part of the solution, um, it's gonna be difficult for you to fight it alone. So this is why we need to come together and form this collective action and build it and make it as big as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Panna. Um, thank you very much. Cecilia, would you like to just say something from, from your perspective on this? Let's take another half hour about this. But yes, um, short, short answer is uh, fighting corruption, everybody has a responsibility, but no one has the full responsibility. And I think unless you're gonna really articulate that well it, through actions, you need to bring people around the table. It's so easy and we do it all the time. That's how humans normally are, that it's so easy to pay, point fingers to someone who is not in the room. But once you bring people in the room through collective action, you start seeing more responsibilities. You start understanding the other, the other side of the problem. And I think it's so easy to come to a solution mode. And I just wanna say that it can really be done, right? We, have, we are working in countries where no, everybody told us, maybe not you, Gemma, but a lot of people told us that it's completely impossible. You can't train change and so embedded corruption. And we, we've created great success stories in these countries, right? We were eight companies around the very first meeting. Um, and we are, you know, over 153 companies today. Um, we thought it was completely impossible to get governments to come to interact with the private sector. And Gemma, you were there uh, two years ago where we had government officials speaking to 150 private sector representatives saying, we actually need you more than you need us. Um, in order to talk about trade, in order to talk about collaboration. So when you get to that point that everybody understands you need each other, that's how you can come to solutions. And it can really be done. I can just say it and there's, yeah, much more to do, but it can really be done. And yes, it should be a part of every government strategy to work and support. And it should be part of every company's compliance program to look at evaluation, collective action, peer dialogue, and private-public partnerships. Yes. Thank you, Cecilia, for that great answer. Klaus, are you going to just uh, add in uh, something that's in the Nordges? Uh, yeah, or... I'm trying to be very fast. I mean, first of all, great statements, courage, and I admire especially the colleagues on the front in the country so much for your courage 
to, to drive collective action. It's not easy. You need courage. Wherever you're sitting in a public sector or a private sector, an NGO courage. And second, as Cecilia said, I call it collective action by design. Uh, it needs to be by design uh, in the monitoring plans of the OECD, uh, in the rules of the United Nations, in the discussions on B20, G20 level. We are just having again on collective action. It needs to be in the system, then it will work. So courage and collective action by design. Thank you, Klaus. That's, that, thank you. That's, that's great. Ambassador, would you like to say something towards the end now or... Um... Thank you, with pleasure, Gemma. I was very, very much inspired by all the contribution and encouraged. It's fantastic to hear about these initiatives as a government official. I learned a lot. Um, let me perhaps say a, a word um, concerning this analogy that has been raised by Klaus uh, between you know, fighting corruption and fighting the pandemics. I think in both cases, trust has proven to be an essential element. Countries that manage the pandemics relatively well are countries where there is a high degree of trust in society and between societal actors and the government. And I very much think that is also needed when we fight against, when you fight against corruption. And to build that trust, I do believe that public-private partnerships, collective action is, is, is a fantastic tool. So congratulations for all what you do in your um, domains. And, and it, it was really a pleasure to be with you. Back to you, Gemma. Thank you very much. I think it just remains for me to say a very big thank you to you, uh, Ambassador, uh, and to your colleagues for helping to organize this panel, and particularly all to my uh, very lovely panelists who are always inspiring uh, and have provided great food for thought and examples for all the, pa uh, all the people who have been listening in. Uh, I wish you all uh, a safe time, and thank you all very much for, for joining today. But bye-bye for now from Switzerland. Thank you. Bye-bye.